quickly give you a little bit of an insight of what is happening in the automotive industry from a trend perspective. How are these trends impacting certain applications? And what are these applications changing the future requirements to materials? Specifically, zooming in into EMI shielding. And maybe already at the beginning, when we talk about EMI shielding, we always talk about EMI shielding plus thermal conductivity. Because we look primarily into high voltage, high power type of applications. These high power applications also generate quite some heat. This is basically, from an application point of view, the tip of the pyramid of metal replacement. Because metal replacement, specifically in automotive, is already ongoing since a long time. Many materials are already validated, many applications are already using plastic as a replacement of metal. With a change of the application requirements, the additional need for two functional requirements came up, which is thermal management and EMI shielding. So it's not only the mechanical challenge to replace metal, like stiffness, impact strength, but in addition, it needs to be thermally conductive and shielding to a pro proper extent so that it can basically properly replace metal in these applications. And we zoom in primarily into electrical cars. Why? Because EMI shielding in the consumer industry, electronics industry, or in aerospace, for instance, is totally common and standard since many, many years. In automotive, thermal management is also a common standard. EMI shielding has to a large extent been basically linked in the past with infotainment type of applications, which is very much on the high frequency side. With the move to electrical cars and specifically with the move to high voltage charging in electrical cars, in conjunction with autonomous driving, EMI shielding is becoming now a prime focus area for many manufacturers in this market. So this is why we zoom primarily into this application. Now, if you look into the automotive market, the automotive market is currently rapidly changing. From powertrain today be mainly dominated by combustion engine. Nearly every car has a human driver. This will change gradually in the future to autonomous driving and full electrical powertrain. The implication of these changes is basically fourfold. The market will move to connectivity and to autonomous driving. As a direct consequence of that one is a lot more sensitive electronics will be integrated. Like ADA systems, car computers, all combinations where electronics is increasingly required to steer the car. At the same time, because of the change of the combustion engine, the automotive design of the car will be very strongly electrified. Electrification, if a consumer also wants to have a car which is capable to charge fast and not just plug it in every time and wait overnight, it pushes the need towards high voltage. High voltage is generating additional EMI specifically EMI, which is also on the low frequency side, which is also magnetic dominated. So two things which will happen and which both in combination drive the need for EMI shielding in conjunction with thermal management. At the same time, of course, also new mobility concepts and partnerships model pop up. So these four fundamental trends are impacting the automotive industry, but we will only zoom in into the first two which is directly linked with EMI shielding in conjunction with thermal management. Now, if you look into a car, there are many different applications in a car. This is just to give you a rough overview of typical applications in a car which require thermal management. Starting from simple cameras and infotainment system all the way up to battery design, where the temperature window for controlling needs to be very, very sharp to avoid fast degradation of the battery on the one side so the lifetime of the battery, but also good efficiency of the battery temperature control is very important. At the same time, there are also applications which react very sensitive to EMI. This type of applications like ADAS, electrical control boxes, infotainment is reacting towards EMI. So these can be disturbed if there is EMI coming from the outside of the car or generated within the car. On the right side, you see some typical EMI sources. Some of them can come from outside. Some of them can come 
from the interface with the consumer, so with the driver basically, typically all wireless type of, of EMI, high frequency, and some of them can be generated in the car, specifically linked with high voltage. This is typically low frequency type of applications. These are typically high frequency type of applications. Both of them need to be properly shielded. Now, what does EMI shielding mean? EMI shielding means you have an emitter somewhere here on the very left and you have a receiver somewhere else, like your other system. And in between, you put in a shield which is blocking the EMI. So the big signal which comes in should be as much dampened as possible. This factor for this reduction of the signal intensity of the dampening is measured in is the attenuation is measured in a shielding level which is reflected in dBs. It's a logarithmic sc scale, meaning a shielding of 10 dB is a blocking of the signal factor 10 to 1. So if you have a level of 10, only one can pass. The rest is either reflected back or it is absorbed inside the material. The prime intention of this shielding is to avoid that EMI can leak in inside and reach the sensitive electronics that you want to protect. It's a logarithmic curve, so every 10 increase in dB means a factor of 10. So to give you a rough feeling, a shielding of 50 dB, just to know what these figures typically refer to, means a reduction of your signal intensity by a factor of 100,000. So we talk actually about pretty significant reduction of the signals when we talk about EMI shielding. Now to give you a feeling what kind of application requirements typically we are talking about, here you see different type of applications in a broad industry, some of them even outside of automotive. Our target is primarily an EMI shielding level of around 40 to 60 dB. And you can see that this is typically the level of EMI shielding that most of the applications require, primarily in the automotive industry. Yeah, so this depends really a lot on what specific application you have, what specific customer you are talking about, because it's always depending on what distance you have to the source, how critical your application is. Sometimes 40 is okay, sometimes 60 is okay. The higher, the more you dampen. These are the typical type of applications that we are looking around. So it's basically electronic enclosures. Can be an ECU, can be an inverter housing where we try to replace metal and still deliver the same functionality both in thermal management and in EMI shielding. Now you can cluster this one into four simple segments from low power to high power and high frequency. High frequency would be typical radar type of applications, infotainment type of applications. The power is basically referring to applications which are also linked with high voltage. Then you see different type of material categories. So if just a normal housing is required, a simple PBT like on the left side can do the job. Just standard metal replacement. If it is for instance a control box of an engine steering or from a windshield opening, simple functionalities, yeah? Just simple metal replacement, standard plastic is okay. The moment you need additional performance, like chemical resistance or high stiffness at thin walls, PBT is not good enough anymore, and a polyamide is a good solution. And of course, there are different type of polyamides. If you go even further aggressive, and you say V0 flammability requirement is needed, dimensional stability is needed, chemical resistance should be even more aggressive, then typically PPA type of materials or PPS type of materials would be a good fit. This is all within the same power category. Now, if you increase the power, at low power, you don't generate heat. So standard polyamide is okay. At medium power, you generate also heat, so typically end EMI shielding because the power goes up. And you remember probably still from university days, every conductor where you have a current flow is generating according to the right angle, angle a magnetic field. So you automatically always generate EMI in that in these cases. If you go to medium power or to high power, you may need additionally the, the requirement of thermal management and EMI shielding. 
the higher the power, the bigger this EMI generation becomes. And if you go to very high frequencies, probably pure metal solution is even the best solution in that one. In this presentation, we primarily focus on these two segments here, medium power and high power. Why? Because this is simple, easy, already done. This is primarily either a metal area or a combination of standard plastic with metal coatings. We are talking about two solutions. One is electrically and thermally conductive compounds. And the second alternative is composites, both as alternative technologies for metal replacement, focusing primarily onto these two segments. Now, if you look into EMI shielding, and if you plot the shielding strength versus relative cost, because very often also the cost is, of course, important for a manufacturer. Very old data, this is already more than two decades old. There are multiple different technologies available in the market. EMI shielding is nothing groundbreaking new. Every metallic sheet, film, coating, bulk metal is doing a great job in, in, in EMI shielding. They have different levels of performance and they come at different cost. None of them is good or bad depending on the application, whether it's emitting or whether you need to block, how intense this capability should be, they are doing a good job by itself. So the important thing is also to find a suitable solution. We are primarily today looking into this area in order to replace these metal incumbent solutions. If you look into this type of applications, they are pretty standard in the industry already used and to a large extent they are mainly used in high frequency type of shieldings which is easy. The moment now the automotive industry goes towards high voltage and high power applications, in addition to high frequency, you generate low frequency EMI. Low frequency EMI to block, you need also a big absorption portion, the volume of the bulk material. So in addition to purely a surface effect of the metal coating, we add also a volume absorption effect. This is basically where conductive plastics and carbon fiber composites, sometimes even in combination with metal coatings come into the game. So if you look into how one could technically solve that one, metallic enclosure on the left is the incumbent solution. If a designer in the automotive world has no targets to cut out weight, has no targets to cut out cost, or has no targets to integrate additional design functionality, like logos or connectors, which are immediately part, becoming part of the housings, this designer should stay with metal. Metal is doing a great job. Performance-wise, neither in thermal management nor in EMI shielding, any of these alternatives can match the capabilities of metal. However, if cost, design flexibility or weight become critical, then the challenge is you want to replace metal and you have these alternatives. You can either take a standard bulk plastic and coat that with metal and each of them you see has pros and cons. Or you can go to a conductive compound again with pros and cons or you go to a composite which is basically the functionality like your microwave window in front just stack different fiber structures on top of each other, 90 degree rotated, and you have it nicely blocked. A big disadvantage of this type of technology is it's not scratch resistant and the metal coating layer can delaminate, specifically under long-term aging, harsh environments, under vibrations, temperatures are cycling pretty heavily, winter time all the way down to minus 30, minus 40 degrees, summer time can easily go to 40, 50, 60 degrees. So it can easily happen that after some time the metal coating is delaminating or during the assembly it can scratch. Now if it is just used for optical purposes, yeah, like nice decorative type of coatings, it's not so critical. But if your radar or your others in general is linked to EMI shielding and a simple scratch or delamination can at a certain time stop the, the trustful reliability of your autonomous driving, it can even end fatal. So this is what cannot happen in this compound solution. That's the reason why we look into compounds. 
after this general short introduction as a kickoff, Michael will now explain you a bit in more detail and zoom in a little bit into, into the details of EMI shielding. Okay. Thanks to me for giving a bit of context about the automotive um, applications in which we're interested in this kind of technology. So I'm gonna, as he mentioned, I'm going to take a bit of a look from a more material science view on what you actually need to accomplish if you're going to replace metal for these kind of applications. So let's start just going back again to this kind of cartoon picture that Tamim showed earlier of what's actually going on in a typical shielding situation. You have some kind of source of radiation, which is emitting electromagnetic waves. They reach your shield. They either need to be reflected or absorbed by the shield. And what is not either reflected or absorbed comes through to your receiver. That's what you want to avoid. And electrically conductive materials are basically excellent both at reflecting and at absorbing uh, electromagnetic waves. And this is why uh, metal is essentially the incumbent solution for this, kind of, uh, for this kind of application. And so the core challenge for metal replacement is making a material with high enough conductivity to actually displace a material, uh, to displace a metal. And to give you an idea of the scope of the challenge, so the typical unit for conductivity, Siemens per meter, you might also be familiar with resistivities, ohm centimeters, this is one over that. Um, to give you a sense of the scale of the challenge, a metal you would use for shielding, like aluminum or silver or copper, has a conductivity of around 10 to the seventh. A typical insulative plastic has a conductivity around 10 to the minus 10, 10 to the minus 13. So we're talking a 20 order of magnitude gap in conductivity. Now, the typical electrical conductive plastics that you might use for something like an electrostatic dissipative application are extremely conductive compared to insulative plastics. So one, 10, maybe 100 Siemens per meter. So you're 10 orders of magnitude up, but you're still five, sometimes six orders of magnitude down from the metal that you're trying to replace. So this is a huge gap. And you can compare that to thermal conductivity, where similarly, it's a challenge to replace metals with, uh, with thermal conductive plastics. There you're looking at a gap of a factor 10 with your, uh, between your conductive plastic solution and your metal, rather than a factor of uh, 100,000. But actually the physics of shielding is very different than the physics of uh, electromagnetic waves. So then the question is, how much conductivity do you actually need? And so to answer this, you can actually open up again the old um, physics textbook from uh, maybe your uh, electromagnetism class. And you can go back just to Maxwell's equations and you can just solve them on pencil and paper and how much of the electromagnetic radiation after bouncing back and forth finds its way out the other side. So you can just write down the solution, look it up in any textbook, that's why it's there. Um, and these models, so you can predict shielding performance based on a part thickness, based on material properties. And these models have been shown to agree well with experimental measurements in the past. So this is data from literature where the dark uh, solid line here is the plot of the shielding effectiveness at one gigahertz, uh, three millimeter thickness for a variety, well, basically for a, for a material. And these dots are experimental points. You can see theory and experiment match pretty well. So we have some confidence that uh, these models can work. And now you can use this to answer the question, how much conductivity do we actually need? So here I'm plotting the shielding effectiveness for a two millimeter thick plate as a function of the frequency for a variety of different electrical conductivities. And what you can see is that these typical electrostatic dissipative um, uh, conductivity levels of 1, 10 Siemens per meter are nowhere near enough to give you this 40 to 60 decibels uh, that Tamim mentioned earlier. Instead, you have to be well above 100 Siemens per meter, ideally in the neighborhood of 1,000 Siemens per meter, if you're going to be able to uh, really do this with a metal replacement solution. Um, you also notice here a typical shape of these curves where at high frequencies, the shielding uh, level increases. This is due to an increasing con contribution of absorption at high frequencies. One way you can think of this, uh, the wave is traveling through a shield of a given thickness, and a higher frequency wave has a shorter wavelength. It has to oscillate more times to make it through that shield, and that dissipates more energy. So you end up having it easier to be shielding higher frequencies. Now, this means, trying to reach a conductivity level like this, means that the traditional ways of thinking about making conductive plastic you actually end up focusing a bit on the wrong thing. So this is a sort of schematic plot of, so typically you take an insulative base polymer, you add some conductive fillers until you reach the conductivity you're looking for. 
and this is kind of a schematic plot of what happens to your electrical conductivity as you add more and more filler. At first, the conductivity is dominated by your isolating matrix, and then at some point, your percolation threshold, you end up with enough filler that it touches each other and forms a continuous network through your polymer material. And at that point, you go through a jump in conductivity of many orders of magnitude. But for EMI shielding, we know for sure we have to be past this. The question is, is our conductivity high enough after percolation? And this is where a lot of the classic conductive fillers used for making conductive plastics actually fall short. So here's an example of uh, open literature data for Ketchum Black Carbon Black loaded into polyamide 66. This is one of the highest uh, conductivity carbon blacks in the world. And what you see, so this percolation threshold shape I mentioned before, you reach a certain loading of your carbon black and you increase in conductivity by 15 orders of magnitude. Pretty incredible. But you still end up only at 10 Siemens per meter. And that's not going to be enough for the shield, uh, to actually have shielding performance. And actually, so you may have seen uh, walking around the fair, there's all kinds of exciting new sort of nano carbon type fillers that are coming onto uh, the market, whether it's nano tubes or nano structures or nano platelets, graphenes. Um, but all of the assessments are often focused, hey, what's going on in this percolation threshold? And for shielding, we care about what's going on up here. Now, a known solution that's been around for some time is to use metal. Basically, okay, we're looking for metal-like conductivity, let's put some metal into our plastic. And that does work. You can get to a quite high conductivity. Um, but if you're looking for light weighting in your application, then loading it to a high percentage with stainless steel is not necessarily going to get you there. Now, this may seem a bit of a grim story that I've been painting so far, but there is actually one piece of very good news, and it has to do with the anisotropy that you usually get when you use conductive fibers as a filler for plastics. Normally, these fibers, when you injection mold, will align in the direction of your injection molding flow. And that results in an anisotropy of the conductivity. You have materials that can be a couple orders of magnitude higher conductivity in this direction, in the plane, than through the plane. And it turns out that for conductivity, that's exact, or for shielding, that's exactly the kind of conductivity you want. And the reason for that, again, going back to uh, electromagnetism, what is an electromagnetic wave? You have an oscillating electromagnetic field, so an electric field flipping in direction that's perpendicular to the direction that the wave is traveling. So that wave comes in towards your shield, the field is moving like this, and when it reaches your shield, electrons in your shield move in response to that electric field. And so they're moving in the in-plane direction, up and down. And when they start coming into motion, two things happen. One, uh, an accelerating electron generates its own electromagnetic wave, and that's actually your reflective component. The other is that the moving electrons dissipate energy, and that's responsible for your absorption. So both for reflection and absorption, it's the, or absorption, the most, the in-plane conductivity is what delivers your shielding performance. So at DSM, what we've been doing is looking into how can we actually make materials which provide this kind of high in-plane uh, electrical conductivity we're looking for, together with the good thermal conductivity that, as Tamim already mentioned, we believe is actually going to be also a basic entry requirement for success in these kind of applications. And so to test our shielding performance, what we do, there are some standard norms that are available, and a classic test is this ASTM 4935, and essentially you're creating this plane wave shielding situation. You take an electronic uh, transmission line, and you insert, insert your metal shield into the path of the wave, and you compare that with the signal level which comes through a reference in which you leave that, uh, that path of the transmission line open. And the difference between those two is then your shielding of, uh, effect in this performance. And just as an example of some of the levels we've been able to achieve, um, these are experimental materials, but we're able to reach with our conductive plastics, conductive compounds, levels of this 40, 50, depending on the frequency, 60 dB, um, that we believe is kind of the entry point for success in these kind of applications. And we do that together with thermal conductivities around one to two watts per meter through plane. Thermal conductivity is through plane that matters. EMI, it's in plane. Um, and we can also do this in Xytron PPS polymer matrix, which offers the advantage of intrinsic UL94 V0 uh, performance. So you have a combination of flame retardancy, uh, good thermal conductivity, and also electronic conductivity sufficient for shielding. Um, 
so these experimental materials are emerging uh, together with our existing conductive materiality portfolio. We already have for quite some time a variety of grades available, thermally conductive, both in electrically isolating and uh, highly electrically conductive forms. So that's a bit about the prospect for compounds. Now, Tamim also mentioned that composites are actually also a potentially attractive solution. And this is again coming back to this issue of the in high in-plane conductivity. Because when you have a true continuous fiber carbon composite, then you achieve extreme high in-plane conductivity, and accordingly, you also can get very high shielding performance, almost potentially metal-like. Um, you do still have to now pay attention to actually your in-plane anisotropy. If you just make a totally unidirectional conductor, then actually what you end up with is something more like a polarizer than an electromagnetic shield. But if, for example, you make a 090 composite stack, you can get good shielding in all of your directions and quite good performance. And to give you a feel for what this is like, here's a similar example of a shielding measurement now on much thinner samples. So this blue line is a simple two-layer stack, half a millimeter thick. This uh, line here is a millimeter thick, four-layer stack. And you see that you're able to reach 60 to 80 decibels with these kind of materials, or even beyond at high frequencies. And that comes together with mechanical properties which are also suitable for metal replacement and structural parts. So if you're looking for real high-performance, lightweight metal replacement, then these kind of carbon fiber composites are really the highest performance solution. That is going to come uh, with some requirements of a more complex part assembly process. Now you'll need to look at things like thermofold forming or overmolding rather than simple injection molding. Um, but if you're looking for uh, the ultimate lightweight performance, then it'll probably look something like this. But in the end, even these kind of carbon fiber composites are still less conductive than metals. And what that means is that simple easy drop-in, 100% drop-in solutions for an existing metal, uh, metal enclosure with no weight constraints are always going to be a challenge. And so there's going to be some real engineering and design required. And in fact, we see basically it'll probably follow a similar kind of trajectory to thermal conductive metal replacement, where DMSM has also played a uh, pioneering role. So there, it's not enough to say, hey, we have a material, uh, try it out. We also take the step of doing real simulation, design, modeling, trying to understand not only uh, how should you design the heat sinks on a part, for example, but how does that interact with the properties of our material, and how should you actually design that part together with the materials to reach the performance that's necessary for a successful solution. And we anticipate the same thing in CAE simulation, uh, in, C in uh, electromagnetic shielding, where basically these same kind of computer design tools we can now use to basically understand how do material properties and your part design interact to come together to determine how much attenuation you actually have inside or outside of your part. And there's also all kinds of other considerations that come in to designing such a solution. The continuity of your shield, uh, how do you maintain things grounded for safety perspective is, uh, from a safety perspective, as to me mentioned also, near field effects, where is your source relative to your shield, how far, what distance. Um, so all of these things are going to take some work um, and that's it's really not only going to be uh, just a simple drop-in. And that's where we really want, um, actually, this is not something that we do on our own. This is something that we do together with you. Because ultimately, um, it's really about helping you as our customers finding solutions. How can we use the, find the right design, which together with the right materials, ultimately is a successful solution for metal replacement.